introduces a real power imbalance when the only people who get to have, you know, get, get to grade the homework of these companies are the companies themselves. You know, they know everything runs on the data center, it's out of view. The only people who get to see behind the curtain are the tech companies themselves. Um, that's, a, that's a problem because as we saw with social media, companies cut corners. These companies, Microsoft in particular, releasing a chat GPT demo that behaves kind of like that uncle who shows up to holiday gatherings, has a few drinks, and then just talks confidently about he does not know about. And that's funny at the holidays, but that's not something we should be injecting into our information ecosystem. Is it funny at the holidays? Good. <laughs> Good morning and welcome back to Washington Post Live. For those of you just joining, I'm Christina Passariello, the Deputy Business Editor for Technology and Personal Finance. Um, we are joined on stage today by two amazing women who have really um, checked the power of technology, which is such an important role as we think about AI and the world that we're heading towards. So we have Frances Haugen, who is the co-founder of Beyond the Screen. Frances Francis, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Happy to be here. And Meredith Whitaker, who is the president of Signal. Thank you so much, Meredith, for being it's with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So, all right. So let's get going. Um, we are going to tap into your wide-ranging perspectives about the lessons of the last decade uh, and how we take those lessons forward to understand where we're going with AI. Meredith, I'm going to start with you. You have been critical of big tech's data practices of collecting personal data, and of course, Signal is encrypted and does not do that. Um, tell me how concerned we should be about how those data practices are spilling over into this new generation of AI. Yeah, well, we should be very concerned, um, but I think we should expand the frame beyond data practices as a discrete element of a business model that could be changed or regulated mm -hmm. to look at the fact that big tech relies on mass surveillance. And this was instantiated in the late 90s when the Clinton administration effectively gave the green light to private companies to commercialize network computation with no restrictions on privacy. So the business model that developed out of this, which Francis has spoken about at length, is this surveillance advertising business model that incentivizes the creation and collection of increasingly invasive data about us, our communities, our worlds, and is now supercharging that voracious appetite for data via this bigger is better paradigm of AI. So, you know, AI is a surveillance technology insofar as it requires this mass surveillance, these huge data sets, and insofar as its application by governments, institutions, and other actors is itself surveillance. It produces data about us. It infers things about us and our communities that in turn create more data, create more information, of course, in the hands of about five companies mm -hmm. who are the only actors in the world with the infrastructure and data that is required to create these systems. So yeah, we should be concerned, but the concern should go beyond data practices to be concerns about social control, about surveillance apparatuses and about what can happen to those affordances when they're in the hands of you know, people with malign intent. And, and we heard earlier on stage today about how uh, the amount of data that's being used now is in the past four years has grown 1,000 fold. So we're in this moment with AI where there's greater and greater need for data. Francis, I wanted to ask you, you've said that both social media and AI platforms are driven by opaque technological systems. Tell us what you mean by that. So if we were to look at something like an iPhone, uh, you know, I've, I've done the search before for Apple whistleblower, you know, like, like I actually kind of chafe at the title of face, the, the Facebook whistleblower because there are so many Facebook whistleblowers, like people who've actually brought up more documents than me, you just don't know their names. Um, if you look at Apple, like there's very, very few whistleblowers. And I think that's because the incentives to lie are substantially less. Right, like if you look at the time between when a new Apple iPhone hits the market and when the first YouTube videos go live of someone taking that phone apart, it's like hours. 
like really high quality videos where they're like, this, this, is, this is the chip they said was in there. This, this lens, that's actually the lens that's in there. People run performance benchmarks on these phones. The incentive to lie is relatively low. Those are more transparent systems. That's what our economy was for the last 200 years. But we're moving into a world, especially as more and more of it is automated, more and more, more of it is run by AI systems, where the actual mechanics of the product you're buying operate on a data center. Like, you don't get to interrogate it, especially if those experiences are personalized to you or, or, or to other people. It means that none of us get to see what a representative experience is. I'll give you even one more little slice, like things like um, ChatGPT, you have a limited number of queries you can do per day, right? Even if you get a paid account, like my husband uses it to help with coding, and he literally has two accounts because he regularly goes through all of his credits on one. Hmm. Um, and so it's one of, he, that is a, if coding can be a drug, like it's like an intermittent reward cycle, you're like, oh, is it gonna work this time? Is it gonna work this time? Is it gonna work this time? AI plus coding, I, I lose him for six hours at a time. But, um, the, uh, and, uh, but, but it's one of these things where in the hands of researchers, you, know, you, you can't afford to get 1,000 paid accounts if you're an academic. Like if you only get a few queries a day on free accounts and they're looking for that kind of usage, we have no idea how these systems operate. And what we saw with social media is that if you can cut corners in the dark, people will cut corners in the dark because like Meredith said, it's a question of economics. Mm -hmm. If you have to report your economic balance sheet but not your social balance sheet, you can take from one to make the other look better. And so we had Chuck Schumer on stage earlier this morning. Senator Schumer was saying that you know the legislative approach is really what's going to help us in the US. Meredith, you have advised Lena Khan. Um, of course, Congress is holding AI hearings and forums. And we heard today that there's going to be another one next week. Um, but you also mentioned the Clinton administration sort of laying the groundwork for all of this yeah. data collection. So how optimistic are you that Congress and regulators will tackle these issues today competently, even though they have not passed any major legislation on the last big tech uh, topic they were focused on, which was social media. Well, they haven't passed a federal privacy bill, and yep. it's been 20 something years, yeah. right? So, what it, you know, like I don't know where optimism would spring from, but it's pretty barren ground. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, and I think the incentives right now are not aligned for the social good. I think we're looking at billions of dollars in lobbying being thrown by these big tech companies, a full-on media operations campaign that has been documented yeah. by tech industry adjacent folks to displace ethical concerns and concerns mm -hmm. about the social harms of these systems with you know, what I would call religious sci-fi fantasies yeah. <laughs> about the singularity and about sort of the super intelligence. Yeah. So you know, we are outgunned in terms of lobbying power and in terms of the ability to put our weight on the decision makers in Congress, but where my hope lies for regulation is not with a kind of, you know, Athena birthing from the head of a senator and saying, like, actually, you need to, you know, do the right thing, but with things like the Writers Guild of America, yeah. who have, you know, I think done the best job we've seen of regulating AI, you know, just non traditionally. They did the classic move, withholding their labor. And they got terms that are actually, you know, staunching the bleeding of the, you know, use by the studios and big tech to place AI within their labor process in ways that will degrade their labor, that will degrade artistic output, and that will actually, you know, I think have a, a real precedent setting move in terms of, of stopping the real harms right now. So I would look to the Writers Guild of America, I would look to SAG, I would look to you know, drivers unions that are contesting the sort of automated precarity of AI systems like Uber and Lyft. I would look to sort of movements from below that are actually tackling the harms now and not simply sitting around and taking selfies with Elon Musk and calling it a regulatory agenda. I, I, I will. I think one of the things that's going to drive those kinds of changes is, uh, you know, people have talked at length where, you know, there is a skills escalator. You know, you come out of college, you come out of high school, and you have relatively low complexity jobs. And like, I had, uh, I had lunch with a friend a couple days ago, and she was, she had been playing around with generative AI. And she's like, I am never going to hire a junior copywriter again. It's like amazing. And I, I looked at her and I was like, amazing for you. 
right? Like in a world where if you are a junior visual designer, you are a junior writer, like the jobs, a junior journalist, the jobs that allow you to then become a more sophisticated contributor, they're about to disappear. Mm -hmm. And if you have enough unemployed young people, you get actions. Like society gets destabilized if you have enough unemployed young people. So clearly, yes, there is going to be huge impact on labor. And we're starting to see that already, right? Um, just in these hiring decisions that people are making. Now, Francis, companies like OpenAI have asked the US government to regulate them, which recalls mm. the position mm. that Mark Zuckerberg was in with Facebook after, mm. after many uh, hearings. Um, do you think that the tech industry has learned the lesson of the last decade about being proactive about the risks of their technology? It's, it, it has, it's not even um, from back when Mark had to justify. Uh, people looked at Facebook's response to 41 state, states, I always get this wrong, state attorneys general suing Meta on Tuesday. They came back and said, we're very disappointed in the attorneys general because they didn't provide us with like a healthy framework. Instead, they did this adversarial thing. And it's like, you fund lobbyists like NetChoice who go in there and torpedo when people try to regulate things. Um, in terms of learning the lessons, I want to really reiterate on what Meredith said around economics drives action. If you have a business model where there is no transparency, there is no having to like report the costs of like the social side of the balance sheet. The incentive is to keep cutting corners. And, and what we've seen, what's actually really disturbed me is like, OpenAI has been one of the more conscientious players as, as much as like we, it's still they're not doing it enough. You know, Facebook came out and published their model. You know, they published, they, they leaked the weights of it. You know, it's not a question of five companies in the world can do these models. Like we have AI today in the wild where you can take stuff that is open source and spend hundreds of dollars and make a bot that is going to be able to like help you run an information operation. Right, like move fast and break things is immediately being reapplied today. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the business models, of mm -hmm. course. Um, yesterday, we reported that the White House is expected to unveil its executive order on AI mm -hmm. next week. One of the things that we reported is that the order will require advanced AI models to undergo assessments um, hmm. before they can be used by federal workers. So baking in an economic incentive um, if you're going to contract with the federal government. What impact do you think that's going to have hmm. on how big yeah. tech is, um, d might develop their models? You know, I've seen estimates that say that the, the market size for generative AI in the next 10 years is going to be on the order of 10 to $12 trillion like with a T, like we're used to talking about billions, we're talking trillions. And, and the, those are modeled off of the idea that for every dollar of productivity you can give a company, they're willing to pay you 20 or 25 cents for it. Um, uh, right now, we have an opportunity through things like this, or like imagine if the Fortune 500 came out and said, you need to meet a certain level of transparency, a certain level of safety bars, if you want us to buy from you. Right? That would actually provide economic incentives throughout the creation chain. Because right now, you have startups that are getting funded. And you want to have the people who are guiding those startups saying, hey, we need to see proactively what your safety plan is. Because we need you to be able to have Fortune 500 companies. We need you to be able to have the federal government to be a client. So I think it's a great yeah. step forward. And, and Meredith, you, of course, uh, were, were became notable in part because of, of your whistleblowing within Google around um, the ways that the technology was being used. Of course, you know, and, and how their business um, incentives sort of dominated over moral and ethical concerns. Now, in this era of generative AI, they talk about being bold and responsible. And of course, they have been a little bit on the back foot, uh, you know, a little bit beat to the market by both OpenAI and Microsoft. How do you see um, th their approach to uh, ethics and morals versus the business balance these days? Yeah, well, I did do labor organizing at Google, and that was one of the few things that actually checked some of these impulses. So I think you know, we can talk about business model, we can also talk about capitalism, right? The engines of these companies are driven by a need, a requirement to report revenue and growth increases every quarter mm -hmm. forever. That's the definition of metastasis, and it is obviously not healthy <laughs> for the social benefit. 
So I think you know we do need those structural checks. I think you know how is Google doing? Look, I don't remember Web three, <laughs> right? Vaguely. Like you know this was a hype cycle. Everyone was predicting you know massive numbers. This is going to change the entire environment. And then you know no one's talking about it. Andreessen Horowitz has even moved off it. They're you know black holing their you know their optimistic manifestos. I think generative AI is very similar. I don't think AI in general is similar. I think they're going to continue to create these large scale models that involve data and compute. But generative AI is not actually that useful. What happened in January was that technology or sort of a, a framework for building models that had been developed in 2017 was sort of put online with an interface by Microsoft slash OpenAI who have to be understood as the same entity. Right? And the chat GPT interface kind of gave people a simulated experience of like, oh my god, I'm talking to kind of a human. It's spitting out nonsense, but it's spitting it out. And this feels kind of sentient. right? And on the backs of this advertisement for their GPT API, which they sell through their Azure cloud services, they sort of generated an entire new hyped narrative around generative AI as this sort of future facing technology that's going to change every industry. But what does it do, right? It, you know, it v presents visual images that are often, you know, stolen from artists or like far too close for comfort. And it presents plausible text, right? It infers what's the sort of plausible response to a prompt based on, you know, mountains of data from the internet, the Reddits, the 4chans, you know, the storm front is in there as Natasha's work has shown, you know, and, and kind of presents text that looks plausible but has no relationship to facts, has no relationship to reality, has no citations, right? So what is this useful for? It's not useful in most serious contexts. Yeah, you could, re, you know, replace a junior copywriter, but you better have a senior copywriter who's checking that text because it's going to be janky. So I think we need to be like really clear about what are we actually responding to. We're responding to an advertisement a very expensive advertisement, ChatGPT, that was put online as an interface that allowed us to have a sort of simulated experience with a yeah. bot that we're now sort of making all kinds of predictions on that I don't think are actually grounded in any understanding of the utility of these systems. And again, you know, Silicon Valley runs on VC hype. VCs require hype to get a return on investment because they need an IPO or an acquisition, yeah. and that's how you get rich. You don't get rich by the technology working. You get rich by people believing it works long enough that one of those two things gets you some money. So but we're seeing another one of those. Is I, 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 I think that sentiment is dangerous, like just come in and say, like, this is, this is irrelevant, like this is just a hype cycle, because we need to remember companies have spent tens of billions of dollars a year, like Fortune 500 companies, tens of billions of dollars a year on teaching their own employees how to write basic emails. Like we take for granted the fact that most people struggle with communication. And you can, it's, I, I fully back up the idea that today you can ask basic factual questions to these AIs and they give very, um, ver very varying answers, right? Um, at the same time, like you can give them bullet points and say like, hey, I'm struggling to write a first draft of this report. Like it used to be, you'd have your junior, your junior, whoever's your junior person on your team, be like, give a first stab at the report, then I'll edit it. Because it's faster to edit than write the first version. People are just putting in bullet points and they get a first version and they edit it. Um, and so I don't think we should come in and say like, the, the, like the, and remember, technology is exponential, right? Like if you sit there and say, this is a toy today, I think it is a toy today. But if you say it's a toy today, you know, it keeps getting better. They're getting better at doing things like structured reasoning. Like we shouldn't just like dismiss that this is not going to be yeah. a danger. I mean, I, just to clarify, I don't, hype doesn't mean it doesn't do some things. Yeah. Hype means that an entire ecology yeah. of sort of, you know, narrative bombast yeah. has been sort of predicated on something that, yeah, it can help you write an email. If that's a problem you want to solve with like 20 billion GPUs, you can do it. Right, but is that a world-changing problem to solve? And what is the actual sort of you know material basis for these what I would call bombastic claims? So it doesn't mean there isn't a you know GPT certainly does a thing, right? But let's like get back down to reality and the actual thing it does before we make all of these predictions based on that. Let's close with a question about misinformation, because of course, mm -hmm. uh, this is something we've, we've touched on briefly here, uh, the drunk uncle problem, I'll say. Um, and, but these models need more data in order to not produce so much misinformation, is what the companies say. Meredith, what do you respond to that? Well, these models have no bearing, it, these models have no understanding of truth or reality. 
These are probabilistic systems that predict what is likely to be the next word in a sentence, not what is right, right? You have to bolt facts and truth and citations on post hoc. So it's, you know, this is not a question of, you know, data quantity. This is a question of how do you effectively turn, you know, sort of a statistical system, you know, into an expert system, which was sort of, you know, the AI wave before this. AI is a marketing term that's been applied to a lot of different technical mm -hmm. modalities. The wave before this was sort of expert systems where you sort of effectively create a map of the world and that, that becomes, you know, the decision tree that the AI follows. This is now sort of, you know, statistically predicting what is likely to happen. You're going to need to bolt on effectively, you're going to have to sort of recreate expert systems to get to that. So th I don't think, I, I think the data quantity issue is sort of a red herring that is sort of produced again or, or being, being sort of asserted by the companies whose you know, business model has always been collect all the data as much as we can more and more and more. Well, or you know, surveillance. Can I give a quick, a yeah, very, sure very sure brief sure. answer? Yes. Okay. So there's a difference between randomized false truths, right? So this is like the hallucinations from general AI, uh, from generative AI. There's a totally different thing, which is organized information operations. And the thing I am most scared about in the 2024 election is it used to be if you wanted to have lots of different pieces of misinformation, because when you have lots of different, just slightly different pieces of misinformation, it's harder to find the network. You had to pay a huge number of people to write all those different permutations. And we're going to see a thing now where you can turn on your model and say, here's my seed piece of misinformation, my narrative. Give me a, a thousand variants. And now I can go test them. I can see like which ones go most viral. And that's going to completely change how information operations work. And that is a, the, the singular most dangerous thing with misinformation, because it's not going to be randomized. It's going to be in directions that are aligned with whatever the interests are of that information operation. I mean, I think the TLDR yeah. is they're good at producing nonsense, misinformation. Yeah. They do not produce truth or veracity. So you know, again, what do these systems do and for whom? This is a wonderful place to end the conversation, thinking about the, the real impact that this technology can have on this democratic process we're going to have next year. Meredith and Francis, thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you.